a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. So um, I'm going to begin um, by asking you to give us a brief introduction about your organizations and also tell us a little bit about your individual roles there. So um, shall we begin with you, Manuel? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Misha. We're really glad to be moderated by uh, such a knowledgeable and unique um, uh, person. So uh, I belong to the Mobilier National, which is uh, the institution, state-led institution, uh, to the Royal Repository uh, of Furniture and Decorative Arts. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, in France we have a national repository uh, whose main mission is to furbish uh, official offices of, prime of the Prime Minister, of top officials and top civil servants. That, that ranged from um, the President of the Republic to the Prime Minister to embassies. And that institution was born in the 13th century when the, the king and his court moved around from palace to palace and the palaces were not furbished in advance. So what happened is that the, the king would send ahead uh, his team of servants a few days, a few days ahead and the, that team of servants would furbish the palace that was left empty. And so it, the, the king actually collected a collection of uh, pieces and of furniture and that collection uh, actually survived throughout you know, all the upheavals and the, the, the different phases of French history and now we are a her, um, heir sorry, to that collection but the uniqueness of the Mobilier National is that we, not, we are uh, we're not a museum, uh, we're not only a heritage institution, we're also uh, um, cultural institution that is very much involved in new creation and so um, we have that collection that we take care of we have you know restoration uh, workshops like upholstery and uh, lusterware um, I don't know uh, cabinet making so we have all those res uh, restoration workshops but we also have uh, the manufacturers that were founded by Louis XIV uh, in tapestries and carpets and lace and so uh, and furniture so furniture the furniture workshop was created in the 60s but so to this day we carry on creating uh, new tapestries, new rugs, new um, uh, pieces of furniture that are based on contemporary design and this is our uniqueness so we are both very much involved in uh, heritage conservation and also uh, new creation and that's the reason why we're here today. Thank you. Harvey? Yeah. Yes. Um, but we are don't have a so long history as <laughs> we listen. Uh, we are both architects, Fred and I. Uh, we are the founders of Owen Atelier. We are a transdisciplinary uh, studio because we are do architecture, also interior design and uh, design, but in the most, uh, we used to, do, to say it's more um, decorative art uh, because we're working with uh, so. Uh, technologies of today for creations but after we do we work uh, only with craftsmen with traditional uh, know-hows to to build uh, new products essentially for the collectible designs we work with canvas representative well. well nothing to add because it's exactly the sum up so <laughs> I'm also an architect and as I said, we, um, we intend to bring the craftsmen into a uh, modern or contemporary language of design. So even we take some new tools from technology, we also being crafted by, we call that golden ends and we collaborate with this kind of golden ends. And we intend to promote also their works through our design and promote them also all over the world where most of our furnitures are sold through fairs, uh, links to our galleries that represent our works. Uh, and so the story of my brand is even shorter. <laughs> um, I founded my luxury furniture brand um, three years ago um, in Paris, the idea was to um, take the, the, the ideas that 
every human needs to inhabit, inhabit a place and to inhabit something and somewhere. And so uh, we needed to create something uh, that takes all the nature and bring it inside and to make people feel comfortable where they live and, and in the interior they live. And so um, the brand name is Artists, which is the Artist is a Latin root of artisan and craftsmanship. Uh, and so I work with mostly uh, the best French craftsmen that are uh, distinguished as the best French craft, craft people. Um, and the brand is, mo I designed everything. Um, then everything is made to order, very customized, uh, customizable by the people I work with very in a very collaboration way. Um, and this, it, it is yeah, a lot of work with all the designers and collaboration worldwide with people. Thank you. Um, so, Emmanuel, you were speaking about um, how Mobilier is uh, engaged in the work of not just preservation, but creation of new work. And so I have gone through some, and you were talking about some of the programs that you run uh, to to select designers and prototypes for your future collections at the Mobilier. So when you're doing that and, and you're selecting uh, the set of designers that you have to work with, what are the kind of criteria that you follow? Well, we, we have several ones. Uh, first of all, you know, um, because the initial mission of the Mobilier National is to furbish official offices uh, of civil servants or elected officials. Um, the idea is that the, well, obviously the piece we buy should be of use in those, uh, in those places. But uh, one of the main mission of the Mobilier National is to be at the forefront of the contemporary creation. So when we buy new pieces, we need to take into account, first of all, sustainability, because uh, not only because, you know, uh, we keep collection for centuries, we, we've been obviously um, running the Mobilier National for more than four centuries, but also because it's uh, at the heart of our mission to uh, have uh, pieces that will go through the ages. So sustainability is really something that we keep a keen eye on and uh, we've been keeping an eye on that for a long time, not only recently. And the other thing is um, it's very important for us as well to, um, to, to stay attuned to the design scene evolution because we not only keep collections to ourselves but we keep it for future generation and for instance, let me give you an example, in the, the early 20th century, uh, so the Art Nouveau movement was uh, um, really re my, uh, developing in France and in Germany, and we the Mobilier National, w which was an existing uh, French state body at the time, completely missed it because the whole uh, the whole French administration at the time wanted to be furnished in very classical pieces, and so it so happens that now we have a gap in those collection, and uh, this gap is a really it's such a shame because you have so much. Uh, our collection also serves as a, an inspiration for designers, and so we really need to, um, you know, to to be attuned to uh, the. The, the, the modernity in uh, uh, the design scene and also make sure that what we buy is going to, um, to be uh, kept aside for ne the next generations. So it's, um, it's actually, we, we don't even know. We try to, it's a bet actually. We, we try to make the best uh, bet and, and try to see, um, to have a very large spectrum to make sure that we see everything that is getting created at the moment. That's why our presence in India is quite important because we get to actually uh, be in contact with other form of creation. But uh, we're never quite sure actually. <laughs> right, that quite, that's quite a responsibility uh, in it its own. And uh, I'm sure the, the selection is quite difficult with so much talent around you. Um, so Harvey and Frederick, there is, a, there is a collaboration that is an ongoing collaboration that you have with uh, uh, a project which is ongoing with the Mobilier National. Do you want to tell us more about that? Yes, we have the chance to collaborate with the Mobilier National and we develop 
a design that you could see here. So it's be part of the inner house of Mobilia National called the Research and Creation Workshop, called in France ARC, so Atelier from Recherche And so they develop the design with us. So we bring the design and they are all in the process for developing it, uh, correct something, and we really um, work close to them and to the team from Mobile National. So now we could say we are both um, uh, we are both the owner of the design, also the mobilier and also her. So it's why we share our creation, so it's a co-creation with. Um, so when, when you, also another aspect that I would like to ask you is that when you create these designs together with the mobilier, um, I, you did tell me that you do, they're turned into prototypes, uh, but then how do you go about the next step um, of probably going to market that what's the process of that uh, that's more an, yeah. that's more for Emmanuel than me sure. <laughs> well so yeah maybe I, I didn't mention that because that's a recent evolution but at the Mobilier National with uh, like it's been a few years now we we've shifted we've shifted sorry a little bit in our scope we know in the sense that we not only aim to furbish official palaces of the Republic, but we also aim at um, like a be a support to the whole design and arts and craft scene. And the thing is, um, we we've been having that well, we that the, the, the workshop that uh, uh, Frédéric and Hervé mentioned at the at moment was created in the 60s. It was created by the Ministry for Culture, Minister of Culture at the time, who was Malraux, and Malraux decided to set up a prototype workshop to make sure that the French designers would stand a chance against the Italian and the Scandinavian because they really were hardly existing. And so the idea is that um, those designers could uh, come to the Mobilier National with an idea and that workshop would translate it into a prototype and the prototype is such a hub in order to m make uh, like a, a larger scale production. And um, and so um, and so, what happened uh, in the past was that uh, it well the prototype entered the collection, and it was up to the designer to uh, find you know uh, um, a mass manufacturer that would make uh, like uh, on a, like make several pieces or even uh, many pieces to of that of that piece. And uh, and at the moment, we we've realized that uh, designers sometimes need help in finding those uh, manufacturers, those uh, pieces, furniture editors, and so we uh, accompany them in that uh, you know in that next step. And so we find um, a manufacturer or an editor together, and then when we sell the new piece, we have the both the stem of the designers who are you know without whom the piece wouldn't exist. I mean, they're, they're the main reason the, the piece exists. But also with our STEM, and the Mobilier National STEM is, uh, we believe, is uh, something that allows, um, uh, allows the, to market the, the piece in a, you know, in a more efficient way. And uh, as I, well, I, I keep repeating myself, but uh, the French state has no money, but it has prestige. So, you know, <laughs> uh, having uh, like that French, uh, uh, Mobilier National Stam hopefully helps a little. Yes, it helps. It helps. It gives a, a, a good a, an, an international also uh, images uh, exposure to the designers. Yes, of course, and it's the op it's, you know, uh, it gives an opportunity to any designers not selected by a name, is selected by uh, design. No. No, it's definitely quite a stamp to have a collaboration with uh, Mobilier National. Um, okay, another very important part of the design process is materiality. And Hugo, with your brand, um, I mean, I've, I've read about it and you were telling me that you lay a lot of emphasis on the materials that you use and especially uh, the intent, the very strong intent of keeping the, the original texture of the material that you use and, and the whole tactility of it. So tell us how you approach this aspect in your practice. Um, like the, um, the process of, it is very coherent with the brand about naturality of everything. So 
I use mostly wood and, and materials that comes from the environment. Um, and I try to keep the texture of it. I don't want to have anything smooth or very symmetrical because nothing is in nature. So I try to always work and, and, and give textures, gives uh, and the asymmetry we can, re we can have in the nature. Um, when I work on a furniture, I've, on, a, on a new piece, I like to mix, uh, the, to mix um, the materials to find the right proportions um, of, of the mix and to create uh, new samples. Here are the samples of works that are, uh, we are working on and so we create things we can add on different pieces and so I try to know exactly where comes, um, where come all the material we use. We know that the, um, the, the O comes from um, a, Burgund a forest in Burgundy. We know when we use the leather where it, um, where it grown up where it was uh, treated, how it was, how it worked, uh, even on the Leviston works, we, it is uh, very important to, to me. Um, and if I need to use uh, a material that I really like, but it's not from France, or if it's not a material that comes from um, uh, or, or techniques that is French, I, uh, I give the importance of the process, of the, pro of the, of the country it comes from. I don't want to stole the, the savoir faire and know-how from uh, the country. I don't, I don't want to stole um, uh, the, the material from the country. I prefer to ask the best craftsman that was uh, created years and centuries ago by the same family and to work from that with the craftsman in a very specific country or very specific region. So. That's very interesting because using provenance in storytelling is also a way of transparency, which more and more, you know, younger brands are actually following. What about you? What kind of materials do you favor and especially the combinations? Uh, what are you experimenting with recently? Uh, it's a different approach because it's much more like an encounter with a craftsman. So we're deeply involved with the craftsman and we discover most of, most of the time the craftsman and we're deeply connected to him and we collaborate to him and we push the limit to him to see what we could do with his know-how. And mostly, most of these craftsmen could be stuck in their practice and we are here to bring them further and to push the limits off. And this is the way we are collaborate with know-how and craftsmen. This is, for example, the, this is made of full of bronze. And it was also an encounter from the center of France, and it's white bronze. It's not used so often, and it's exactly the way we use it. But the slide after, for example, is we use really advanced technologies here because is um, how to say that it's automotive um, uh, yeah automotive prototypist so they bring technology here and use the lastest technology as computing and anything and 5d milings and etc and it's how we, we use technology and you could see it, we hide it, <laughs> at least. Everything is linked together, but we don't show how it's fixed together. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, um, okay, go ahead. Um, that's the, the lamp which is exposed actually in the, in the pavilion right here. Uh, that's more, a more classical um, d design making, I would say. Uh, but um, because technology doesn't work actually, five, uh, five, uh, five 3D miling doesn't work. It has to be uh, sculpted by hand because it not works with the machines. Uh, this, and that's another one, and uh, in that we work with a very traditional, and so we have this, the similar in India, uh, so... The Hammersmith. Hammersmith, yes. 
Hammersmith and after we um, we use a marble which is yet is forbidden because it's in the Pyrenees. Is a, we have also marble in, in in France, but in very small quantity and not very easy to extract. Uh, and that's a very special vein. It's a, um, mar a marble called the Four Season Marble, and that's the spring <laughs> the spring version because you have the Four Seasons. Uh, maybe we ch could change. I would say maybe something they don't know, but lots of French marble are displayed at Versailles because Versailles used to be the big showroom from the royalties to send how the uh, house could be sent hold to the, the other countries and foreign countries. Um, that's another kind of uh, research we have done. It's a table made on only of lava stone without any glue or a screw or nothing. And uh, uh, the, the research was essentially on the enamel because um, we're looking to, uh, how say that? Um, uh, adapt, to adapt a technique which is used in, a, in a ceramic and you wanted to adapt it on, a, on lava stone. Uh, it's like a flowering uh, of the enamel when you put it on the oven, so you have temperatures to rise and to go down. And, uh, and we tried with the uh, enamella, uh, which, uh, and it doesn't work because the stone uh, uh, melted. melted. <laughs> so we, we search in another way, we find it. So it's a three pass in the oven to obtain those kind of flowers. Uh, I don't know if we have more details. Yeah, it's not, it looks like snowflakes, but here the details you can't see. It's exactly the way I say that we are pushing the boundaries because we are looking for a technique that's used on ceramics and it doesn't work here, obviously, because all the stone melted. So we did to find another story and another know how to make it. So the craftsman came two weeks after and say maybe I found something and we were really pleased too but he was really afraid of because you could see it's a random patterns and he say oh man I never could do the same and I say it's exactly what we are looking for but they are not aware about this because they used to do something perfect and we are just showing how the hands could make some make some values so it's exactly what we intend to do. Uh, you have a, a thing here. This is from acrylic. So it's another technology. But it's much more easy to make it. Even it's also cook on the mold. And after we need to miling and polish it. And this is um, an armchair. This is quite... Um, classic on this way but it was developed also by automotive prototypist and we develop all the arms and correct it by virtual uh, reality so it was quite fun because we were just to run something that doesn't exist in true and only by virtual, uh, virtual reality and we correct all the shapes only on virtual reality and after it's translated to really traditional craftsmanship. So it's bronze inserts that have been also prototype in 3D printed. and printed in 3D to make the mold and sound casting mold. And it's a way we could develop something on design based on technologies, but rooted to the true craft and um, the way after yeah traditional one and you could see how we are going to design the next step of the armchair so we are developing the sofa and all come first from a sketch and after it turned to computers and it's r rendering from computers and after we make the first edition because we, do, we don't do prototype because we already sold the first edition each. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a premier mondial. Uh, it's the first time it's publicly presented because it's uh, actually in, in, in development in, in Lyon. 
and it's going to be presented, I hope, in the end of the year. Uh, let's see. <laughs> we show another one, which is also uh, a 3D prototype. We are developing actually at this time, but uh, we are not working with French craftsmen, but working with Italian ones. But the brand we work with is French. Uh, it's Veronese, which was founded uh, in, the, in the early 30s. It was during the period Art Deco. And um, the specificity of this uh, brand is that they work with all the, all the range of the, 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 the glass, the glass yeah, blowing or casting. And so, and so uh, this, this lamp actually used casting and used blowing. And after we do all the technology with LED and we use also the, how say now, the physical, um, the, f the physicality of the glass to transmit the, the light because the light is only in the in the ceiling and after just under and uh, the light is only going through the through the through the glass yeah so. and it's also today the official land ah, after <laughs> so i i would say that that we also push the boundaries because it's the most biggest shape we could do uh, in this kind of fusing thing. Uh, no, it's casted, yeah. And we use exactly um, the physical effect of the, the glass, and it's why we ripple the surface to make sure that the light could transmit through the glass. So another very important question when we talk about sourcing materials and responsibility is, of course, the sustainability aspect of it. So tell us more about how do you factor that in, in your design process and right from when you begin thinking about the design till the production process, like where, how do you approach it? About the sustainability of the design or, or the production? This is true. Um, anyway, uh, what we've chosen to do is not industrial design first, and working with small ateliers in the majority. After, um, our vision of design is that we're not doing something that's going to be in stra uh, trashed in the dustbin in, in a few years. It's more a transmission, transmi yeah. it took value with the years, it's not the, so we use only m all good material or more precious material which are not, uh, we're not losing, uh, yeah. It's a way we, we only made by, by on demand. So first there are the no stock and we really truly believe that we want to make designs that could last um, for uh, generation and transmit from your, well, for the next generation and this is a way for us to make sustainability and we also work um, on terroir so we use the craft from the region where it comes from for example it's a way we see the sustainability for example the lava stone is made on the way where the stone is extract and this kind of stuff. It's the way we think sustainability is a good way of. Hugo? Yes, I actually have the same approach for uh, transmission of the work. Um, I try to uh, know where the, the material uh, from uh, in the process. Uh, um, regarding the wood, I try to work um, as more as I can uh, with French forests that are uh, ecumenage. So when we cut a tree, we plant another one instead. Um, um, for every aspect, even in, in the process, the making process, I try to have the craftsmen very close to each other to limit transportation in between uh, and to be to have the, a very minimum um, people involved in the process of, um, of the very minimum atelier uh, between um, uh, and even on the leather part uh, we try to know exactly how it works we try to have it tanned 
uh, uh, vegetally, uh, so it not involve any chemical processes or um, ch chemical materials. Uh, and the idea of every business is to last as long as possible to be uh, generated gen from generation to, an to the next uh, and to be able to repair everything so we can work and change everything uh, to keep the beauty of the, of the piece each time it, it is. Yeah, that's very interesting to know that it's a holistic approach, right from how you're sourcing materials to, you know, how you're thinking of um, reducing carbon footprint to the entire process. And I would say also we intend to to make the craft make live also for future generation also. So we bring the craft to the contemporary scene and make it living. So we hope that maybe they could also inherit it for the future generation to learn this craft and to make it lasting for, gener for the future generation also. If I may, and uh, with the craftsmen I try, I, uh, when I start a relationship with every craftsman, uh, we work together and, cr and I have a shelter with them uh, about eco-friendly and socially responsibility. Uh, and so that they are committed to create things uh, that are uh, responsible, uh, respectful for everyone involved in the process. Uh, um, and that is not also the case for, for every material that never source something I'm not aware of and I want to accept everything. Uh, and so uh, formally they know that I won't accept the f materials that is not um, uh, eco-friendly or comes from an eco-friendly um, manner and so uh, it is a way to work very uh, uh, with a mind very free with them and so we'll, I, I don't really care I mean I know what they're going to do and I know it's going to be great and 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 great in it I mean in all my process and all the mind the mindset of the brand right I think um, I also read a news um, very recently where EU is um, placing a ban on greenwashing, the term that they're using by different brands are using, uh, you know, the terms like sustainability and eco-friendly, etc., in a very loose way. So there's, there's, that's like a stepping stone to being, uh, enabling like a more transparent way of doing things for brands as well. Emmanuel, my next question is to you. Um, while we're talking about sustainability and um, coming back to the original topic, what are some of the new methods or processes of production that you see that the Mobilia is using through the factories, through the different programs that they run? Well, we don't have all the answers yet, unfortunately, but we're really keen on trying. So, first of all, so far, uh, we've, uh, we've done a lot of work on sourcing because obviously we have those uh, tapestry and carpet workshops and they use wool and we are trying to, we're supporting a group of people who are trying to um, resettle in France uh, a breed of sheep that has, uh, because our sheep, our, sorry, our, the, the wool we use in tapestries comes from New Zealand. I'm very ashamed to say that. <laughs> but we are trying to recreate um, a sheep breed that would, uh, so a French one, that would, has, uh, that would produce uh, such a wool that would be solid enough to, to create for tapestry. So that's the first step. We also launched a program called Aliene. Uh, Aliene is a program where we um, send invites to designers and artists to um, reinvent. So I told you, we have a very large collection at 130,000 pieces, and not all of them are valuable. And for those pieces which are not valuable, we, uh, we actually lend them to artists and designers, and we ask them to redesign them to completely, like they're completely free of the intervention, but uh, they can do whatever they please. But, um, you know, this is sustainability as well, because you have a new piece of furniture uh, that will be uh, reincorporated into the national collection, but um, this is a way to say no that 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 the life of that piece has not come to an end. Exactly, uh, we've launched uh, very recently. That was on, on Tuesday a lab for sustainable solutions. That so um, we've been dyeing uh, the wool with uh, with well. Um, 
artificial colorants uh, because since the 50s because wool uh, color sorry is a very uh, important means of you know expression in tapestry it's actually the, the almost the the main mean and so we need to have to be very very precise on the tint we want to get and that was possible only with uh, actually artificial currents but we realized that this is not you know super so we've been uh, launching a lab and it's a three years program and and that lab is going to um, provide solution and also uh, well you know um, random go everywhere in the world to try to see what the solutions are. And also, uh, we launched and we are going to, to be, uh, well, carry on, the, carry on that, that piece of line of work. We launched um, a material library because not all materials are, are equal in terms of sustainability. And so that, materi that library is going to be um, available to all designers in Paris so that uh, not only our uh, workers and our uh, craftsmen will be able to choose the best material and sustainable material for restoration or you know um, creation purposes but also all the designers that are willing to incorporate that line of work into you know their, their thinking and lastly may I add because it's a bit of a funny example of course arts and crafts are going need to um, be very um, sensitive and, and, and aware of that question of sustainability but sometimes they do provide solutions as well um, I suppose you're all aware that there's, a, uh, there's been a real like, um, uh, deterior deterioration of the coral reef, you know, by in the Pacific Ocean, Australia, etc., etc. And so that reef is absolutely essential for the life in the ocean. And uh, there's a designer, an artist, French designer and artist, that realized that the, the coral reef actually, um, well, is... is, is being alarmingly uh, so is uh, is getting deteriorated because they don't have uh, the space in which they settle is actually being destroyed and that artist realized that lace lace you know uh, has the same structure has a structure very close to the surface that uh, the reef usually uh, used to to settle and so we've done an experiment and I'm so glad it worked so that uh, we have also we also have lace workshops I don't know if I mentioned it but uh, those lace workshops actually provided um, some some pieces that were used and uh, put it as an experiment in an aquatic environment and it so happened that uh, the reef uh, larvas or you know babies uh, settle onto that structure and so these these were biodegradable sorry uh, uh, fibers and so we uh, we managed to um, to fasten significantly the uh, the process of, of development of recreation of uh, the coral reef thanks to arts and craft and that's a, a very nice story I think it's uh, it shows how arts and craft also provide solutions not only need to take that turn but um, are a part of the solution as well yeah that's an amazing story and a very good example <laughs> Um, so you spoke about the lace workshops. Yes. Uh, what are the other, the most prominent crafts uh, that the mobilier works with in terms of the factories that you have or workshops? Well, we we have um, uh, well uh, tapestry. We have looms. Uh, so uh, we have looms with people working with the 17th century, you know, techniques. And uh, we are actually building uh, the the loom of the 21st century because this is, uh, you know, um, working on the loom can be extremely tiring and even damaging for the body so we're working on that we are very uh, focused on upholstery as well um, lusterware cabinet making everything from uh, renovation to creation that pertains to wood metal work uh, the different field of uh, cabinet making so we have very you know different workshops um, so the, the, the panel is extremely, extremely, the spectrum is extremely large, actually. Uh, Harvey and Friedrich, uh, your work, you were telling me earlier, is highly inspired by the 20th century design, and especially by, by Pierre Paulin. Not especially. Not I mean, especially, but yes. In, yes. In one, oh, uh, you, you, did, of, yeah. you didn't mention. <laughs> so tell us about some of the, some of the old 
techniques or traditional crafts that you like to use in your work and how do you reinterpret them to suit the current market? I, I'm going to take the example of the sofa. Um, it's not only Pierre Paulin because it's just um, it's, it's a, a way of working. Of a, for us, what is essential is to have a, a certain culture of history of design before doing something because um, uh, you, you can create from nothing. That's impossible. Humanity is not based on that. It's based on ex experience and what was experienced before and we, we do, we work like that. So um, we use uh, all what was done. So most of it, yeah, f 20th century because before it's what we call more classical, but we can find it uh, actually with a uh, the mirror uh, in bronze is inspired by antiquity. So um, the forms and the designs, well, the mostly are inspired by the humanity in general in the creations. Yeah, and uh, in, in the case of this sofa, uh, you can find different uh, different uh, influences like Poulain, but also uh, Vladimir Kagan for the United States or uh, Jean, Royer. Jean Royer for the famous Ours Polaire. So it's um. Okay. It's uh, like a work of sampling. <laughs> it's boiling there. Uh, <laughs> to reconstruct something new. So uh, the foundations are, are on, a, on, a, on a culture or a, yeah, on a culture and a history or something you, you learn and learning you have to do it all your life. So it's not over. We, uh, I always say that we have our own mental library that we could pick off what we want into and re rearrange it and we don't know where where it came from sometimes but we could pick from all our references and all what could be nourish or nurturing our creation so it's a way we're doing design for example it could be uh, an antique uh, civilization it could be more in the 20th century uh, it depends on what the craft could lead to also its way we are creating. It's not really a process, really pr like a program. It's always new when we um, invent something. But we are truly think that most you are aware, most you could bring something new to the creation. And not creating a copy. Yeah. Or bad copy, it's li at least the worst. No, I think it's quite interesting. Um, it's, it's not just the reinterpretation of the traditional techniques and crafts, but it also is a reinterpretation of our approach, um, even when we are designing and the thought we give to it. And Hugo, we know that with Hartis, you emphasize a lot on acknowledging each and every artisan and craftsman and designers that you collaborate with along the way. So tell us more about that. How, how do you, how did, that become important for your brand and how did you think of that? Um, because artists, the name, the name of artists is all about craftsmanship and so I wanted to be able to emphasize and to show how res the, the, to give even more respect to the craftsmen behind every piece because we are uh, uh, the people in front and, and showing and, and on uh, on view to everyone, but we al we always forget that behind there is our craft people, and so we want. I wanted to be able to show, uh, to uh, to to take advantage of it, and so to to show um, the techniques. So uh, the first collection, uh, in uh, in particular, is all dedicated to to the techniques of craftsmanship, uh, and so it's there's what every. Uh, pieces is, is um, ha um, has it in the name of a very specific technique. So I'm using the techniques and, and emphasizes everything and and pulling the craft people um, outside the uh, the 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 atelier and showing them and told, telling about them and sharing the the experience I can have with them uh, uh, with barely everyone because it needs also to be to have the recognition that it served because I won't have anything um, produce or anything in the brand I mean they are totally part of my process and this collaborative process I have with them uh, so uh, I, I, I need and I felt that that need to 
for to 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 show who who, who they are and what they do actually. No, I think that's that's amazing, and uh, even in India here, we see um, this is also a way of uh, keeping your your craftsmen and the artisans and and those those know-hows alive. A very good example is um, a brand like Jaipur Rugs over here um, in India, who who does that every step of the way. I think every artisan that they work with, every cluster that they work with, they they believe in acknowledging and empowering the people who are working even at the back end and not just you know give the forefront to just the main designer so i think that that's a very very important part um while we're talking about your you know the artisans that you work with i think um it's it's fit to speak about collaborations which has become uh, the new way of life for all of us um uh, it's i think it doesn't just fit into the design industry it's across industries that we see that this has just become the the way of being in a way um so tell us about um i actually want to understand from you there is a very interesting uh, collaboration that uh, is coming up for you and that's actually with uh with an indian designer and a residency that you both are working with um tell us more about that i think uh you're working with gunjan gupta from india and yes. uh, tell us more about this residency program um, yes uh, we are uh, and there's a program which first exists in uh, in maroko it was designed a residence uh, created by um, the art design lab karin cherer uh which is going to have a second edition this year and uh i proposed to her one night for the evening <laughs> tell her yeah but we have maybe to uh, hide to uh, to go to india because they have a lot they have a lot of drafts uh there are also other countries but it was one uh, i was thinking about and she says okay go and so we started and we started with another person which is here later which is based in mumbai <laughs> which helped us a lot uh, to to construct here and after we we meet also Amandine uh which accompanies us uh, also to construct this project is a project uh, with student is a uh, is a private um uh, it's not just a uh, private initiative but it's made for construct bridges the between future creators or designers uh from the NID in Ahmedabad the, the most of its big school i think in asia in design and uh, ecole boule which is almost a famous one uh, <laughs> in France and to uh, yeah to encounters to culture and to to find a place in Jaipur and working with craftsmen uh, first time in Jaipur i hope it it will be also done in the second part in France with the indian in France and uh, to create so uh, we were going to make couples french indians and to co-create so uh, so design during 10 days and after we are going to have a, a show in i think normally in mumbai but maybe also in new delhi and maybe i hope we going to work with the mobility national for maybe for this exhibition but uh, a presentation also also in france about the how this work and i think it's a good um good way to see the uh, perspective so also to to share our between our two culture we have a lot of common points also uh in the art of vivre but also in the craftsmanship uh and a long history of exchanges so uh, in jaipur also we have all the, the jewelry and uh yeah after we have chandiga you know well <laughs> so with the combination but it's a it's a it's a cross history between the two the two countries which which makes sense with this uh with this residence uh which is a continuation of all of that i hope and maybe uh strengthen the, the the links between the two countries and make more exchanges uh, almost so maybe yeah no it's a um, it's a cross view from two countries and two different way of thinking and we hope that they could bring bridges from these two countries is i hope the long lasting collaboration between these two countries and um, thanks to the support from the french institute and the cultural minister of france and hope to the mobile national also so and we are waiting also for support from india so maybe 
Right. I think um, it's an amazing program. I, you talked about it earlier, and um, this is actually um, opening up uh, new horizons for the younger generation and the beneficiary, especially students, who are then bound to think very globally when they're working with their local crafts and you know the, the resources that they have in their area. But, but the approach to when they design and they produce is going to be more global, which is more fit for uh, the urban audience. So I think it's, it's a very, very amazing collaboration. Um, I'm going to ask my closing question to Emmanuel. Um, there is also an initiative that, um, that we, we heard about last night at the dinner, uh, which is um, led by the Mobilian National. And we hear that you are going to be now working on a project where they're, they're going to be French and Indian designers together, and that's going to happen next year. Tell us more. Yeah, absolutely. It was a wish of the French President of the Republic who came to India a couple of months ago. And so the whole uh, point of this exhibition is to foster dialogue between French and Indian culture, but with a special eye for this, well, only uh, the, the main objective is to focus on Austin Craft. And so um, we are going to launch it and organize it. It's, it's going to take place in 2025 in Paris at the Mobilier National Gallery. And uh, we, th so because this is a joint um, initiative, we very ho much hope that um, the, the, the exhibition will be jointly curated by both a, an Indian and a French creator. So, should you be interested, please step forward. Uh, <laughs> also, um, we will be uh, showcasing both uh, cultures, know-how and savoir-faire. So, may I add that we will uh, take part to that residency program and also welcome uh, residents in the Mobilier National uh, workshops. So, that's a different program, but um, should you be interested in that I will as well, please let us know. And so so um, also the, the, the whole format of that exhibition is not uh, set up in stone as of today, but uh, we are in early stages. And so we, I take this opportunity, of the opportunity of this talk to uh, let us know, that um, to, to invite you to let us know uh, if you have any interest in showcasing your work or taking any sort of part in this uh, exhibition, well, uh, please let us know. So this is me and Loïc, the blonde haired <laughs> uh, uh, director for development at the Mobilier National who are in charge. And uh, we really have very high hopes for this exhibition. We really hope to welcome you um, as well as you did today. Thank you so much. I think we're just in time if there are any questions from the audience. I have a question for Emmanuel. Um, I'm very interested to understand the process that is followed for design concept to final approval and the financials around it. And do you think your organization has an influence on the design aesthetics of the country because you are in that position to commission work for uh, something that would be the face of um, the government or uh, uh, historic monument, uh, you know, palaces. So I'm very curious, and I'm almost thinking that what would happen if we were to replicate something like that in India? So, I mean, I'll take up more questions uh, later after the, we conclude the session. Thank you know, you. Being a, a state-led institution is a two-faced word. Uh, on the one hand, um, uh, you are associated be with being an official design and uh, being an official design is never a good thing. But on the other hand, uh, we own what, what we actually um, notice on a daily basis is that it really has an impact. For instance, the other day, uh, so we, we also provide furniture for, I don't know, special occasions, say G20 or Congress or a special interview, uh, you know, a televised interview of the president. And I think it was six months ago, we, um, we decorated the interview setting with a special um, armchair of, uh, and, and table of uh, very young designers. And after that, he was overwhelmed with, uh, with uh, demands of people who you know, uh, asked us and then asked him. And there was actually an article in the press saying, well, you know, this, uh, the, 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 um, 
the added value of the Mobilier National is to uh, act as um, a showroom. So I wouldn't say we're trendsetters because, you know, we, we, are, we buy and we, we actually receive the trends from designers. We are not at the origin of those trends. But we help some trends that we think are, you know, valuable, maybe get more visibility. I hope that... Uh, yeah. I just... Ha yeah. What, did, what you don't say is that when they select, uh, when they buy, you just say buy, but no, they curate it actually. They, do, they choose, uh, this is curated by, guy, by persons. So, no, yeah, they have an influence anywhere. And the more and more it advances, yeah, with the campagne d'acquisition, every year they bought new furniture, for also from young or the old designer. But it's, uh, the selection is all already really precise, it's uh, well done, they have precise uh, selections, yeah, it's a limited edition normally, yeah. But it's, it's a certain... Well, maybe I'm, we're limited by financial means. <laughs> so we, we, what we have is press coverage, what we have is prestige, but we have limited financial means. What we do, what, uh, actually uh, Hervé was mentioning at the moment, uh, is that we do a yearly acquisition campaign. It's a little bit of a Marshall plan, a very, very small Marshall plan, uh, where in which we buy, so we buy new pieces by young designers, and then we like organize a big um, uh, collection of, you know, um, introduction to the national collections. There's a big press coverage, so that's the extent of what we can do. But obviously, uh, you know, we s we rely on you know much bigger groups uh, to well to be the to take the next step. We only the initiators then, you know, bigger groups and maybe bigger brands uh, will uh, then... Uh, they have a larger responsibility, yeah. I think, to, to have, uh, to preserve the, the future collections and what the, the future of design is going to look like in France rather than sticking to, like, trends which are generally short-lived, uh, <laughs> I think. It's an image of the time <laughs> for, for history. But our aim is definitely to help, uh, definitely to help. And we came, we came from an institution that actually was uh, that secret and didn't showcase its work, showcase its work. And now we were taking a different approach and say, no, well, uh, we can make a contribution to you know the economic sector, the the, the design scene, and uh, with limited means, but you know maybe some uh, some resonance, uh, resonance, some echo, some 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 noise, in, in some sense. One last question. I can speak without the mic. <laughs> I feel more comfortable. <laughs> so I wanted to know when in your journey you met each other. And if you can describe uh, one another's uh, strength, yeah, okay. in, uh, in, creative, in the creative scene, of course. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, it, it depends on the piece. Sometimes I'm starting from a sketch, sometimes he's starting from a sketch. And after we correct it to each other, and until we are not pleased together, we could argue a lot. And after when we are all together pleased, we could say, okay, we could stop here. But it's a long journey together, and we argue a lot, I could tell you. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's time for closing up the panel because a cocktail is waiting us outside, and I don't want to be responsible of keeping the people in the room and then they tell me there's no more cocktail available. <laughs> Uh, I would like to thank everybody who took part in this amazing afternoon. It's been, I think, very intense. We had amazing panelists, both from France and India, which was very important to us because we are not coming just to showcase France. We are coming to engage in a dialogue. And I think that's why also Misha was here, Greg. Uh, you've been instrumental in building that dialogue this afternoon, so I would like to give a, a big applause again to our moderators and to our last panelists of 
of the evening. And now you'll get plenty of opportunities to know more about their work, who they are, what they do, and to see their exhibition also in the other building while you're having a nice drink. Thank you, all of you. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.